-hmm. All right, problem 11, we have the resting heart rates and beats per minute. They were recorded for two samples of people. One sample was from people in the age group of 20 years to 30 years, and the other sample was from the people in the age group of 40 years to 50 years. Hmm. The five number summaries are shown in this table. Okay, so we got the age groups in the rows. And the values of 60, 62, 84 were common to both samples. And the three values are identified as outliers with respect to the age group 20 years to 30 years because they're either 1.5 times the IQR range greater than the upper quartile or 1.5 times the IQR range less than the lower quartile. Using the same method for identifying outliers, which of the three values are identified as outliers for the age group 40 to 50 years? Okay, so we want to find what 1.5 times the IQR of the um, 40 to 50 year old group would be. So let's remember that the IQR is the, is the, is the distance from Q1 to Q3, so 70 to 76, and that'll be six. So the IQR or the 1.5 times the IQR is 1.5 times six, which is nine. So essentially, you want to see if there are values that are not that are more than nine um, units below Q1. So 70, so more than nine below 70. So below 61, that'll be your lower bound. And more than nine units above Q3. So 76 plus nine will be 85. So above 85. Okay, so 60 counts for below 61, of course. So we got one outlier and nothing else. All we have is outlier 60. And so the answer would then be B. All right, 12. We got that as part of a demographic study, a college administrator needed to survey a sample of students from the college. From each major offer, offered at the college, the administrator randomly selected 5% of the students with that major to participate in the survey, which is following is the best description of the type of sample selected by the administrator. Okay, so you can see that they broke the um, sample survey or the you know sample into subgroups or into strata. So this is gonna be a stratified random sample. Um, Let's remember, remember, uh, we use stratified random samples when um, you have some, when you, when you have some, you know, reasonable um, belief to, to think that there's going to be a factor um, that may influence the results. So you want to account for that factor. So for example, let's say like, if you were testing like the caffeine and the coffee, and, you know, you're testing you know, all the students that, you know, at the high school, they're probably you probably want to stratify them according to age, just because you know there's a big difference between a 14 year old biology and an 18 year old biology, just you know their size, and maybe the and maybe by coffee drinkers, maybe there's students that have never drank coffee ever, and there's maybe there's seniors that drink coffee maybe every day, and also by gender, just because of body size. So, stratified random sample would be a good choice. By number 13, let's zoom out a little bit on this. All right, so we got the graph that shows the population distribution of random variable X with mean 85 and standard deviation 18. And we wanna find which of the graphs is the sampling distribution of the sample mean X bar for samples of size 40 taken from the population. Okay, so the sampling distribution, the sample mean X bar. So the mean of the sampling distribution of X bar will be equal to the mean of the population. So in that case, it's still gonna be 85. And then we have to find the standard deviation of the, of the sampling distribution of X bar. Now that's gonna be equal to you know, you can, let's look at our formula sheet. 
which will come in handy. So we would look at the, we will take the population standard deviation divided by the sample size, by divided by the square root of the sample size. So in this case, it would be um, 18 divided by the square root of 40. So 18 divided by the square root of 40, about 2.85. And since our sample is at least 30, um, the central limit theorem um, applies. So then we know that sampling distribution will be approximately normal. So let's look for the one that's centered at 85. So um, we could be C or B looks like, but C is not, um, it's not normal enough. Like it's too, uh, there's on like the, it looks more like a histogram. We need more smoothness. So B would be an answer. That that best fits a normal distribution, approximately. All right. Number fourteen. A biologist studying trees constructed the confidence interval, point fourteen to point two, to estimate the proportion of trees in a large forest that are dead but still standing. Using the same confidence level, the, inter the interval was later revised because the sample proportion had been miscalculated. The correct sample proportion was 0.27. Which of the following statements about the revised interval based on the correct sample proportion is true? Okay, so let's recall like the form of a confidence interval. We have our point estimate, p hat, plus or minus, our critical value, in this case, be z star, times the standard deviation of the statistic, which will be p hat times one minus p hat over n, all square rooted. So we wanna see how changing the p hat will affect you know, the, this, you know, this um, value. This is the margin of error. We don't care where it's centered because you know, where it's centered is not gonna necessarily change doesn't change how wide it is. It's, it's, basically, it's basically how much um, variability there is around where it's centered. So this was centered at um, 0.17. So the p hat was 0.17 in that case. But the new confidence interval will be centered at 0.27. So nothing else is gonna change so the z star, we don't have to worry about, and even the sample size n. So the only thing that's really going to be um, necessary to, to um, calculate and compare is the p hat times the 1 minus p hat. We want to see what happens to that when we change it from 0.17 to 0.27. Does it become bigger, smaller? So let's look. So we have 0.17. Times one minus 0.17, so times 0.83. And the other one would be the square root of 0.27 times one minus 0.27, so times 0.73 over n. So let's see what happens to this value on in the numerator. So we get 0.17 times 0.83. This becomes a 0.1411. That one 0.17 times 0.73, or 0.27 times 0.73. This becomes a 0.1971. So this is a larger numerator. And again, we don't we only care and we only need to worry about the numerator because the sample size stays the same and is the same. And we want to look to see if we're taking a bigger square root because if you're taking the, the square root of a bigger number, then, this, then it's going to be a bigger number. The square root of a bigger number is a bigger number. So this is going to be a larger value. And so what happens to the confidence interval is, is that is it becomes wider. 
And um, if you remember um, maybe touching on this topic, um, when we would calculate sample size when for, for um, a margin of error, and let's say you didn't know what the, um, what the, what a good, what uh, any data on what a sample proportion could be, we would be conservative and we would remember you, you were told to use 0.5. And that's because the 0.5, when you calculate the standard deviation, when you calculate the numerator, it gives you the largest value out of any decimal between zero and one when you multiply it by itself. So that's why we use that because it's the most conservative. And so let's look at our answers. You can see that. So the revised interval is wider than the original interval because the correct sample proportion is closer to 0.5 than the miscalculated proportion. That's why they mentioned this. And it's gonna be usually another question or so about that on the test that's worth looking over. And that's gonna be dealing usually in, um, when you first learn about um, sample proportions and sampling distributions. So the answer is D.